Well, good evening. If, if I somehow start on fire tonight, it's because of all the connections I've got going here. <laughs> we got the local speakers here, we got the live stream going, and, and we've got the camera, audio, and all this. So there's a lot going on. I hope it all works smoothly, but I appreciate you being here this evening. I'm sure there are many other places you could be. Um, this is going to be a fairly unique talk on a topic that's a little different. Usually when you guys gather, it's something very, very directly related to creation versus evolution. This is going to be a little bit bigger picture talking about science in general and what we've been running into with what they are calling uh, settled science uh, because they're using it kind of as a club, as we'll see, to get you to do whatever it is that they want you to do. And sometimes it's intimidating because you don't know how to respond. So uh, that's the talk that I'm going to be giving here this evening. Um, some of you know me, some of you don't, so I'll go through my background very quickly here. I was raised in a Christian home, and I always say you can clearly see that that is a Christian home. And uh, I believe the Bible from cover to cover. I went to public schools all the way through high school. Then I went to a Christian college, John Brown University in Arkansas, to study mechanical engineering. Got a degree there, but then I became more interested in physics. Uh, John Brown didn't have a physics major, so I left there, went back to Wisconsin, where I'm from, and went to the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater to get a degree in physics. And when I got there, all my professors were telling me that I was wrong about everything that I believed. And it was the first time in my entire life that I realized, yeah, I know what I believe, but I don't know why. I mean, I never thought about it. I just, it made sense. I just believed it, and I was never really challenged. Well, all of a sudden, now I have these PhD physics professors challenging me and telling me that I'm you know, wrong about everything. So that made me very uncomfortable. I assumed they had a lot of evidence for what they believed. I found out later they had zero. <laughs> I don't have time for all the stories, but they, they literally had no examples of evidence for what they believed because I eventually asked them. But anyway, God put it on my heart at that point in my life to start looking into my faith. And I was very excited about it. And the thing that really drove me, like really quickly, side note, today so many Christians are being, um, are walking away from their faith before they leave college. They go to college, they get challenged, like I was challenged, and they walk away. I've been speaking for 37 years now, and it wasn't until about seven years ago, after 30 years of speaking, it was the first time ever that I asked myself, how come I didn't walk away? You know, I was challenged like everyone else is challenged today. Why didn't I walk away? It took me a half a second to figure out the answer. It was my relationship with my parents. That's what it was. I had such an awesome, Sheldon knows my parents, my mom's nephew is here. It's just, um, my parents were great and I, had, I respected them. And so when I was challenged, I never thought for one second that my parents were wrong. I never thought they lied to me. I didn't think my pastor was wrong or that he would have lied. And I, I reasoned. If I'm not wrong, that means I'm right. If I'm right, that means there's got to be evidence. And if there's evidence, I'm going to find it. And so it drove me to go find the evidence, and now it's been 37 years. But it hinged to my relationship with my parents. And I share that as a, hopefully an encouragement to you as parents and grandparents to make sure you have a decent relationship with your kids because that's going to play a huge role. You know, when kids go off the tracks, you can't just throw a bunch of facts at them like, oh, I didn't know that, and then they get back to church again. No, it's... It's largely a spiritual issue and a relational issue, so that's, that's a very, very important part. So I needed to share that. Um, felt called into full-time ministry almost 16 years ago. Founded the Starting Point Project. It's all about our starting point. That's another talk. I actually gave that talk uh, Sunday night at Radisson Road Baptist. But I've been in full-time ministry for 15 plus years, traveling around the country, up to 190 talks a year. Been in eight other countries as well. I was also invited to be on the board of directors of Logos Research Associates. Um, very quickly, it's not BioLogos. And I, I have to throw this in here. This is the first time I've ever thrown a slide in on this. I'm part of Logos Research Associates. BioLogos is a completely different organization. It's a group of scientists who are probably Christians, but they're really pushing evolution big time. And they want to get into all the... Christian uh, universities, Christian schools, seminaries, churches, and push evolution. And they've got a lot of money behind them backing that. So I'm not on the board of BioLogos at all. I would uh, definitely quibble with their beliefs about scripture and creation. But 
Uh, this is Logos Research Associates. The founding member of this group is Dr. John Sanford. He's from Cornell University. He's famous for having invented something called the gene gun. It inserts genes into the DNA. Worldwide famous for that. Very godly man, very humble as well. Then there's Dr. John Baumgartner. He's a PhD geophysicist. He's built the world's best 3D computer simulation of plate tectonics. Just off the charts brilliant. Even secular geologists use his model for when they're considering how the plates in the earth actually move. Uh, so those are two of the founding members. And then there's myself and we, there's six board members. And I always jokingly say if they were here this evening, they'd be the first to admit out of all six board members, I'm the tallest. <laughs> And uh, that's about all I can brag. These, these guys are brilliant, and I just appreciate hanging around them and picking their brains and learning some cutting-edge science and then translating it into something we call English <laughs> so, so that normal people like you and I can understand. So that's just a little bit of my background. This is going to be you this evening. You're going to be drinking from a fire hose. I normally talk fast. I'm not only going to talk fast this evening, but we're going to cover an awful lot. Because this topic of settled science is a huge, huge topic. We certainly can't cover the whole thing. I'm going to basically describe our current situation, share some general principles, cover a few specific issues, and then generally frustrate you with all the things that I don't cover because we won't have time. Again, we're just scratching the surface with all of this. But it's really about the ultimate authority of Scripture. Do we as Christians really trust what the Bible says, or do we go somewhere else first and learn things and then take that as knowledge and use that to figure out what God actually meant? And many religious people, many Christians actually do that. They learn certain things, especially from science, and then when they're reading their Bibles, like, well, I know it says this, but it can't actually mean that because we know better now. Because the astrophysicists have told us this, the geologists have told us that, the biologists have said whatever. So we take that, you can't question that because that's science, right? And many people approach scripture that way. We, we know better now, we know all these wonderful things and so we need to look at God's word differently. I don't think so, I think again, even though the Bible is God's first shot, first shot at writing a book, I think he did a pretty good job. <laughs> and you could trust it from cover to cover and absolutely everything that it says. And the more we actually look at science, the more it backs up what God's been telling us all along. So the world we're living in today is certainly upside down. Uh, it's crazy. We all know that things have always been trending downward. You know, morally, we've kind of been going downhill a little bit. Well, a couple of years ago, just the wheels have fallen off, and it's just gone crazy. We don't need to go into all the details. You, you know what I'm referring to. The world has really changed drastically so fast it basically has made our head spin, and we're faced with all of these issues now. And it's not that any one of these is too difficult. It's just that there are too many of them. They're overwhelming the system. It's like the guy on the stage that has all the plates spinning and he's running around keeping all those plates spinning. That's kind of what we're doing today, where you think you made some headway with one of them, but then, oh, this one's going to fall off. You run over here. It's just, it's, it's too much for us. But this is an important point. These issues here aren't wrong because they're problematic. Yeah, they're causing problems, so we've concluded they're wrong. No, they're problematic because they are wrong, meaning they go against God's created order. That's very important to understand. Very quickly, there's one on here, climate change. We'll talk about that a little bit this evening. Some of these uh, in the list are in a little different category. It is not proper to say that climate change is right or wrong. Climate change is climate change. Our understanding of it or our response to it could be wrong, and I think it is. <laughs> we'll get to that. I just didn't want anyone walking out thinking that I said climate change is wrong. I wouldn't say it that way, and we'll get into that in a little bit more detail in a bit. But this is important. No matter what topic anyone brings up, one of these or, or a different topic, it should never be your philosophy versus theirs. Who are we that the whole world should care what we think about any one of these topics? They bring one of these up, we should always say, hold on a second, let me see what God's Word has to say. If they have a problem with what we share at that point, it's not with us, it's with God's Word. And someday they will be accountable to that. It's just up to us to very graciously help them understand what did God say about whatever interesting topic they bring up. And these are 
real topics. People are really, truly struggling with it. Even if you're not, and you might think one of them's crazy, that might be true for you, but other people are actually struggling with it, and they need to know what God has to say about that, and they really need Jesus Christ to help them work through these many, many struggles. So we hear this with cancel culture and censorship. It's, the time for debate is over. It's been settled. It's time now for action. So they've shut down the debate because, hey, they've done the work for us. They've figured out the truth, and now it's just time to do whatever they're telling us needs to be done because of whatever they're concluding. That's where we are today. Here's an interesting quote from Richard Feynman, theoretical physicist. I would rather have questions that can't be answered than answers that can't be questioned. And I would agree with that. I have no problem not knowing the answer to everything. Nobody knows all the answers. That's okay. But I don't like it when we can't question someone else's answer. <laughs> but that's the society we're in today. You are not allowed to question what they're telling us. George Orwell said, the more society drifts from the truth, the more they will hate those that speak it. Yeah, basically you will be canceled. If you dare speak out against their narrative, their truth, you'll be canceled. <laughs> John 15, 18 said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. This is interesting. Think about it. Jesus Christ is God. When he was here, everything he did and everything he said was right and perfect and proper. And they hated him. And they killed him. What chance do we have? <laughs> None. None. That's the bad news. The good news is God's not asking you to make sure everyone's happy with you. God is asking us to speak the truth in love. And we would expect that they're going to hate us because they hated Jesus and he did everything much better than we will ever do it. So we should take the pressure off ourselves that the goal isn't to make sure everyone's happy with us. The goal is to be speaking the truth from Scripture, not just our own philosophy, not just trying to win an argument. Another interesting quote. It's easier to fool people than to convince them they've been fooled. And I found that's true of myself. It's not that hard to fool me in certain things. You don't have to work probably too hard. But it's difficult to tell other people that they've been fooled, that I know that you've heard this and it sounds good to you, but it's, it's actually not true. Because then they're going to give you the response, yeah, you're right and all the scientists are wrong. That's intimidating because you feel like you're, getting, you're wanting them to trust you and ignore what all the scientists are saying. Who wants to be in that position? Probably nobody, but that's the impression that they give you if you're telling them they're wrong about whatever it is that they've heard. Mark Twain had an interesting quote. Oh, you know what? Because this is running through something other than just straight PowerPoint, my... Uh, my animations aren't consistent at all, so I'm seeing things that are throwing me off a little bit, and one of them just occurred here. I'm gonna to have to back up and tell you what this actually says, even though it's all blurred out. He basically said, if you don't read the newspapers, you're uninformed. If you do read them, you're misinformed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's more true today than even when he was saying that. You know, if you don't watch the news, yeah, you're probably missing out on some information, but if you do watch it, you're getting a lot of misinformation. Very, very interesting. So we're gonna move along here, talk a little bit about um, general information on science. For many people, science is just out of reach, and this was supposed to be an animation. Here we go. Again, for many people are in a position where they don't have a background for science. They might not have an interest in science, or maybe they have a background and interest, but it's just they don't have time or, or whatever, for, for whatever reason. So really, truly understanding the science maybe isn't something they're interested in or they know much about. And because of that, they have to pretty much sit at the feet of the scientific magisterium. Whatever the elitists are saying, we just have to trust them and go with whatever they say because they're the experts, they're the leaders, and you're not in a position to question them because you don't even understand everything about astrophysics or climatology or whatever it is that, that they're bringing up here. But that's okay because scientists are unbiased, right? <laughs> and that's what we're supposed to think. They're, they're just in laboratories doing experiments. So there's no bias there, right? <laughs> well, if you're a meteorologist, you have one goal. One goal, and that is accuracy. <laughs> If you are telling everyone it will not rain tomorrow and then it pours out, everybody's going to know you were wrong. And if you are consistently wrong, you're going to be out of a job. 
I mean, that would be understandable. So there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of internal pressure for them to be accurate with their predictions. But that's not necessarily true with other scientists. You won't necessarily know if they're wrong. They're doing experiments. You're not going to have access to their actual data and other things. What do they leave out? What do they put in? What do they, what do they misinterpret? You won't necessarily know that. So there's not the same level of pressure to really be that accurate or honest with many scientists. There's a lot of pressure from money, politics, peer pressure from uh, prestige. All those things can influence what they tell you is their conclusion. Some scientists even know what they're saying isn't necessarily true, but it's what they're told, this is what we're saying, this is going to go over the best, this will accomplish what we want. So there is pressure there to say something other than what they can see clearly for themselves. And science certainly shouldn't be political, but way, way too often it is political. And I think we've seen that quite a bit with COVID and climate change in particular. Um, <clears throat> with science, science basically means knowledge. It doesn't mean wisdom. <laughs> There's a big difference between knowledge and wisdom. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Many scientists don't fear God. A lot of them don't even believe in God. So they might be really smart, meaning they have a lot of knowledge or facts in their head, but they lack the ability to interpret these facts properly because that takes wisdom. And the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, and if they don't have that, they're going to really struggle in their interpretations of all the facts that might actually be in their head. And then you may be asked, what do you believe? Do you believe the Bible or do you believe science? Again, that's an awkward question for many Christians to answer. If you say you believe the Bible, that implies you don't believe science. But then the skeptic is going to say, you know what, I could have sworn I saw you on your cell phone the other day, but oh, that's right, you don't believe in science that made that cell phone. So then you say, well, no, I, I believe in science. But if you say you believe in science, that implies you don't believe the Bible. And if you don't believe the Bible, you can't be a Christian. Kind of awkward. Well, there's a hidden assumption here, and the hidden assumption is that science has disproved the Bible. If that were true, then you have to choose between the two. But the truth is that's not true. <laughs> science has not disproved the Bible. In fact, most major areas of science we have today were founded by Bible-believing Christians. Here are a few examples. Hydraulic, uh, hydraulics, oh, this is really odd. There's two lists here, and they're both showing up at the same time, so bear with me as I try to sort through some of this. We have hydraulics, hydrostatics, oceanography, optical mineralogy, paleontology, pathology, physical astronomy, stratigraphy, thermodynamics, thermokinetics, vertebra paleontology, the scientific method, and there's a whole bunch of others that are behind that that would have come up separately, but the animations aren't going to going to be a favor of me tonight here with that, but there's just a whole list of all these areas of science that were founded by Bible-believing Christians. So again, anyone who says no real scientist believes the Bible, they don't only not understand science, they don't even know history. This is where science came out, was birthed out of the Christian community. And the definition of science has been hijacked. It used to simply put, be something like this, discovering explanations for the natural world around us. These men and women who founded these areas of science, they just took for granted, of course God exists, of course he's the creator. You can't get something out of nothing and you can't get design without a designer. It was just so obvious to them that God created everything. And so they set out to discover explanations for the natural world around them, the one that was created by God. He's a God of order. They expected to see order in his creation. And so they found all these regularities and found in different areas of science and laws of science. So they were just trying to discover explanations for how this world is operating. But it was a given assumption that, well, of course, God created it. They're just trying to figure out, like, how does it operate? What did God do to keep it going? But the definition has been slowly hijacked, so hopefully this will work. Watch the definition slowly morph. It is now discovering natural explanations for the world around us. They have ruled out the supernatural right from the beginning. They are now only looking for natural explanations for everything, including the origin of the universe and the origin of life and the origin of species. They have ruled out the supernatural. Dr. Scott Todd said, even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, such an hypothesis is excluded from science because it's not naturalistic. 
What's he saying? Even if all the evidence screams a creator, a designer, a God, they're just going to rule it out. Well, that can't be evidence because that can't be science. And it can't be science because that shows evidence of God or the supernatural. And we don't want that. We're only looking for natural explanations. So they will never find scientific evidence for design or a creator. Because if it lines up that way, they'll just say, well, that's not science then because they philosophically decided they don't like it. There's nothing in science that rules out God. It's just that when you redefine science, you can get rid of God very easily, and that's what our public school systems do today. They're teaching the origin of everything apart from the supernatural, not because the science shows that you can't have a supernatural, they just don't want it in our educational system anymore. And it's kind of like this, if I asked each of you to write a 100-page research paper on the origin of that laptop. But here's the catch. Nowhere in your paper can you ever refer to people. <laughs> Scientists, engineers, software engineers, programmers can never talk about them. You come up with some really crazy stories as to how we got a laptop if you can't go there. And that's what our science textbooks are filled with today. Explanations explaining the origin of the entire universe apart from any power source, a designer, a god. How do you get life started from dead chemicals apart from God? All this, they're trying to explain that with natural causes because they don't like the idea of God. They've already ruled them out. And then people say, yeah, but science says, guess what? Science says nothing at all, ever. Science has never said anything. Scientists say stuff. <laughs> they look at different facts and then they tell us what they think about that. So science doesn't say anything, but scientists do. And here's another myth about science. It's black and white. It just is what it is. Scientists go into a laboratory, they do experiments, they come out and they say, we're sorry, this is just what it is, we can't help it, can't argue with it, it's black and white, and, and follow the science because you can't argue with it, right? I mean, we hear follow the science all the time. Well, the truth is, science isn't black and white. It's very colorful. There are a lot of different ways to interpret things dependent upon what you believe to begin with <laughs> and what's all of the data rather than when you, you know, cherry pick things like that. So it's not black and white like they want you to think it is. And science is used very often as a club to get you to do whatever it is that they want you to do. They will intimidate you with it in many different ways. I'm going to go through each of these really quickly here. First of all, it can be overly technical. What's that? That's when they're explaining something to you and they are going so deep you don't have a clue what they're talking about. How can you possibly argue? Because you don't, you don't even understand what they're saying. And very often they will do that on purpose so that you can't argue back. Usually if someone's going that deep, they're either trying to fool you with something or they're not a very gifted speaker at all. Because everything, no matter how complex something is, you can share it in a, in a more simpler way so people can understand the gist of it. I could teach a six-year-old how to do computer programming, how it works. You sit down at the computer, you type in instructions of what you want the computer to do, the computer reads those instructions and then it carries out those instructions. That's computer programming. That is 100% accurate. It's not 100% detailed, <laughs> but it's true. And now a sixth grader or six year old would understand in general how computer programming works. Can I get more technical? A lot more technical. But you can explain something simply. So when they're going that technical, sometimes it's because they don't want you to try to argue back at all. Secondly, elephant hurling. This is where they throw out very large, vacuous statements like, Evolution is an absolute fact. All scientists believe it. It's proven by evidence from every area of science. Those are large, vague statements with no specifics to back it up. And it's okay to start out with things like that if you follow up then with examples and details. But usually you won't get any of those. You just get the large, intimidating statements. All scientists believe it. You're going to doubt that? You're going to doubt all scientists? Well, it's not even true that all scientists believe it, but those are the types of things they'll say. An appeal to authority. Well, this certain thing is true because these guys are world's leading experts in that area. You know what? They might be world's leading experts in those areas, but that doesn't mean that everything they say is true. It has to be backed up by evidence. You can't just say because this person's smart, whatever they say is true. 
but they will intimidate you by saying these people are leading experts. Shaming. If you don't believe what we're telling you, you obviously don't care about other people. You don't care that people are dying out there. And so they will shame you into agreeing with them because otherwise you look like the bad guy and no one wants to be the bad guy. Uh, eliminate discussion. That's the whole cancel culture. Not even allow for debate. So many times on television you're only hearing one narrative over and over and over. I, I don't watch TV anymore, but a lot of people tell me they'll turn on one news channel and they'll hear a certain phrase, turn to the next channel, same phrase, same phrase, same phrase, same phrase. Well, there's a narrative that has gone out saying, this is what we're going to say. It's, it's not a coincidence that they're just making up the same unique phrase. There's a narrative and they're not allowing the other side to be heard. They don't have to because they've already done the science. It's settled, right? That's how they get around that. Then we have consensus science. Whatever it is they're telling us is true because the majority of scientists believe it. Well, guess what? Even secular scientists hate that concept. They say science does not work by consensus. Something isn't true because we voted. It has to have evidence for it. And many times in science, things get changed 180 degrees because of one person. They discover something and like, oh my word, that totally disproves what the majority we're believing for years and years. We don't determine truth by consensus. Academic censorship. We won't publish your work because you're not real scientists. Why are we not real scientists? Because you don't publish in our journals. Why can't we publish in your journals? Because you're not real scientists. Why are we not real scientists? Because you don't publish in our journals. It sounds kind of funny, but that actually happens to creationists. <laughs> Once in a great while, they'll allow something to go through. And I, I don't have time for the example, the specific example right now, but there was a high level scientist, one of the world's leading scientists submitted, he's a Christian and a creationist, he submitted something and it actually got published in a highly technical journal, kind of an obscure journal that most people have never even heard of, but they actually published it. And I was shocked. And so I talked to the scientist later and said, hey, what was the response? What, what happened with that? He said, silence. He goes, that's what they do. Once in a great while, they'll actually publish your work. And his work had nothing to do. He didn't talk about God or Genesis or Jesus or creation. He was just talking about mutational rates. That's all it was. It was great scientific work. He said they'll publish it, page 48 in the corner, and then nobody comments on it. And it goes away. It's like it was never there. So that's what they'll do with the academic censorship. They generally won't publish you at all. When they do, that no one even really comments on it. The doggy head tilt. This one's kind of interesting. This is my daughter's dog, Cooper. Yes, he's cute, and yes, he knows it. <laughs> um, someone says something, and it just, it's like, what? Just like, you really wonder, did they just say that? So they'll say, creation theory is not science because it's not testable. And then they turn around and say, we've tested creation theory and proven it to be false. <laughs> Wait a minute, you can't have it both ways. If you're claiming it's not testable, and therefore it's not science, you can't tell us you actually tested it and proved it false. But they will actually make statements like this that, again, make your head tilt. And then lastly, misleading headlines. This is really common. You'll see an article and it'll say something like, you know, recent discovery proves a Darwinian ape to man evolution. That's the headline. The majority of people will see that headline and that's as far as they'll go. They won't read the article. They're busy. They don't really care. They've got their proof right there. It's the headline. More evidence for evolution. When are these Christians going to give up their silly belief in the Bible? That's all they need, the headline. Some people will start reading it. And it'll say, you know, in 1833, so-and-so, and they're like, ah, I, I don't have time for this. What did they discover? I want to know what they just found recently. So they give up. Some people will read the whole thing. They're not thinking too deeply. They read through the whole thing and just walk on. Some people read through the whole thing and they get to the end and they say, wait a minute, there's nothing in here that backs up the headline. A lot of detail and stories and stuff, but there was nothing that backed up the headline. In fact, at the end it said, many scientists remain skeptical. But it doesn't matter because the damage has been done. The headline was there, 99% of the people saw it, more evidence for evolution, that's all they need. Misleading headlines. It's very easy to put whatever you want in the headline or scrolling on the bottom of the television with no details behind it, but you just see this happen or that happen or whatever. So that's very powerful too. 
And science is never really settled. In fact, you know what? Eggs are good. Eggs are bad, right? And then they tell us aspirin is good. Aspirin is bad. And then they say chocolate is good. And then they say chocolate is good. <laughs> Don't fight me on that one. You'll lose. <laughs> um, they're changing their minds all the time on things. And we could go through a lengthy, lengthy list. Now, if you want to determine which is more dense, lead or cotton, I'm OK with that being settled. Because you can have thousands of people going into the laboratory and all doing the same experiment and coming up with the same result. I'm OK with saying that, that that's settled. So I don't leave you hanging. It's lead. Lead is more dense than cotton. Now you're wondering how dense I am. But, but other things are not settled, especially again with like COVID and climate change and things like that. We're going to talk next about when science was wrong. Guess what? Science has never, ever been wrong. <laughs> Because science doesn't say anything. <laughs> it's when scientists were wrong about their opinion, because we don't know everything. We discover new things, and we have to change our minds. So this is just, just a few examples of when scientists were wrong. Uh, the practice of bloodletting. Scientists used to drain blood out of people's bodies when they got <clears throat> sick, thinking it would cure them. That's largely how George Washington died. He got pneumonia, goes to the doctor. Oh, he's sick. You got to get rid of that bad blood. So they drain his blood. He got sicker. It's like, wow, this guy's really sick. So they drain some more blood. He got even sicker. It's like, this guy's really sick. They ended up draining about a gallon of blood out of him, and he died. No surprise. I think it's Leviticus 17, 11 says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. The Bible knew that a long time ago, and we know better today. You don't drain someone's blood when they're sick. The reason I have a barber pole up here you used to be able to go to the barber to have your blood drained, called it bloodletting. They'd give you a cylinder like this to grasp, cut your arm, drain some blood, and then wrap a towel around there to stop the bleeding and absorb the blood. Sometimes they would hang the used towels on the cylinder outside to dry, and the wind would catch it and it would wrap around the pole. That's why today barber poles have red stripes. A little bit of free trivia, I won't charge you for that one, but it's true, <laughs> kind of interesting. Then we have Ignaz Semmelweis. Hungarian doctor in the 1800s. This is really, really interesting. At that time, the mortality rate in Europe for women giving birth in hospitals was 25 to 30 percent. What does that mean? That means 25 to 30 percent of women going to those hospitals didn't come home. They died giving birth. That, that's horrendous. Well, Dr. Semmelweis noticed something. And this will make your stomach turn today. You can't even imagine it. He noticed doctors were going into a room to perform an autopsy. Then he'd walk across the hall and deliver a baby. No prep in between. We, we can't even imagine that today. So Dr. Semmelweis tried something. He started washing with water and chlorine. The mortality rate for him dropped down to 0.85%. Instead of the doctor saying, hey, thank you so much for discovering, they said, no, stop with all the hand-washing nonsense. That's crazy. Like, that's going to make a difference. And so women kept dying because of that. They ignored what he had discovered. He was interned in a mental hospital and severely beaten by guards while he was trying to escape, and he died a couple weeks later at the age of 47. What about follow the science? There they rejected. They were arrogant. No, no, he couldn't have found something. That's too simple. Well, now we know today. We know how much prep we do in hospitals, and we know about germs and bacteria and COVID and all those things. Mercury. They used to use mercury in our medicine. Now we go to great lengths to make sure there's no mercury in anything, in fish or whatever it is. It's poisonous, but they used to have it in the medicine. They were totally wrong about that. And the concept of junk DNA. When scientists were looking at DNA, it seemed like only 2% of our DNA did anything. It coded to make proteins. The other 98%, they were calling it junk. It's useless. Proof of evolution. Because God wouldn't design you so that 98% of your DNA is useless. Well, they studied it further, and they determined that that 98% they were calling junk, that's more complex than the 2%. It's instructions telling the 2% what to do. It is just blowing them away how complex DNA is. I think the first time I spoke to this group, I gave a talk on DNA, and it's, it's just fascinating, and we've learned even a lot more since then. That caused one evolutionist to say the failure to recognize the implications of non-coding DNA, that's what they were calling junk, 
will go down as the biggest mistake in the history of molecular biology. Huge mistake to ever call that junk. It is so complex, but that's when scientists were wrong about what they were thinking. So we're going to look at two sample topics here as we continue to talk about the myth of settled science. We're going to look at COVID-19 and climate change. No controversy here, right? <laughs> um, there will be a little bit, but I'm going to work on being very tactful about all of this. We're going to start out looking at COVID-19 and the idea of follow the science, but it's really more like follow their science, whatever it is that they're doing and then telling us what we should be doing in response. This is WebMD, very prestigious website, medical website. The title of the article here was Year of COVID. Here's the subtitle. Surprise, you know, it says everything we thought we knew was wrong. Did they say they were off in a few areas? No, they said everything they thought they knew was wrong. Oh, what happened to follow the science? <laughs> They were screaming at us, you need to do this. We researched, this is the truth. You do A, B, and C now. Oops, we were wrong about all that, which means what we were doing in response to it was wrong. By their own admission. That reminded me of a cover story of Time Magazine talking about dinosaurs. The cover story was the truth about dinosaurs. So what are they gonna tell us? They're gonna tell us the truth about dinosaurs. Very intriguing, like, oh, I gotta read that article because what's the truth? Apparently, I don't know the truth. There was a subtitle on this cover that I could not believe they put on there. I thought they did not think this through. Here's the subtitle. To surprise, just about everything you believe is wrong. I thought, wait a minute, where did most people learn about dinosaurs? From them. But now they're telling us all that stuff is wrong that they told us. Well, if they're admitting they were wrong about what they told us before, why should we trust them now? because they are admitting everything they kind of shared with us before, with all their magazines and everything was wrong, but now they're gonna tell us the truth. Well, it doesn't make any sense because they could be just as wrong this time as well. Very quickly, COVID-19 treatments. Caveat, I am not a doctor. I don't own a lab coat or a stethoscope, and I am not here to tell you whether you should get the vaccine or not get the vaccine. I have very strong opinions about all of this. But it's not important for you to know what my opinions are. You want to talk to me privately? I can talk to you about it. But I'm not so important that I need to stand here and tell you what you need to think about these things. We're just going to look at what we were told and were those things true or not. The CDC, which is the organization that apparently dropped out of heaven, right, to tell us the truth and give us guidance in, in all these areas, well, they talked about hydroxychloroquine which is a prescription drug developed in the 40s used first to treat malaria. So they were telling us about this treatment. They claimed that a study had been conducted in which there were 96,000 COVID patients from 671 hospitals on five continents who were all treated with hydroxychloroquine. And then they published results in the Lancet, which is the leading, world's leading medical journal, very, very prestigious. And in that article, they said that the claiming the hydroxychloroquine did not help curb COVID-19 and could even cause death in patients, okay? When doctors were reading that journal, which most of them subscribed to, they were reading that, it was like, they thought, oh, that's really interesting. I, I don't remember that study occurring. The reason they didn't remember it, it, it never happened. So here's a study that never happened that the CDC claimed did, and then they post results in the Lancet, the most prestigious medical journal, informing all these doctors, don't use hydroxychloroquine. It could kill your patients. So the doctors, I think, mostly innocently thought, okay, thanks, thanks for that research. I, we don't want to do anything that's going to hurt anybody. Isn't that sad? I'm not telling you to get the vaccine or not. I'm just saying this is not good. When they say settled science, when they say this, this, this causes problems. Again, it's not so much follow the science, it's probably follow the money. I'm not gonna go down that rabbit trail here, but that often leads you to the truth. Then there was an article in Rolling Stone about ivermectin. They claimed that Oklahoma hospitals were overwhelmed by patients who had overdosed on ivermectin. So much so that gunshot victims could not be treated in the ER because they were so overwhelmed with people overdosing on ivermectin. Guess what? Never happened. 
but because they published it, all the other new, news outlets could just refer to the Rolling Stone article. And so you turn on the TV and you hear people are dying from overdosing in ivermectin, and the hospitals are overwhelmed and all that. Like, oh man, you go to the next channel, same thing, same thing, same thing, article here, this, it's like, wow, it's gotta be true if all the stations are carrying it and all the other newspapers and all that, but you trace it back to where it came from, that first place was a lie, but no one knows that. You just watch TV and like, oh, I guess this stuff is bad. I was going to kind of look into it, but not anymore. To me, that's dangerous, and that's malpractice if you're pushing settled, the science, settled science. We will very quickly move to climate change, another one of those things that people have different opinions on, including myself. It's related to something called the Great Reset, the Green New Deal, environmentalism. Here's the Green New Deal from Prager U. Uh, the government should prohibit the use of fossil fuels and switch through mandates, that means forcing, to the use of 100% renewable energy. That's what the Green New Deal is all about. Well, today, 80% of our energy comes from fossil fuels here in the United States, which is coal, oil, and natural gas. Only about 3.4, maybe a little bit higher now, comes from solar and wind. <laughs> well, what's wrong with solar and wind? Well, it's unreliable. <laughs> Only works when the wind's blowing and the sun is shining. It's not consistent. And you may remember last year in Texas where the pinwheels froze <laughs> and they lost power. It, it was close to a very, very dangerous blackout. It's not good whatsoever because it's not reliable. They weren't planning on things getting that cold, but it did. And they are close to being maxed out in their efficiency because of something called physics. You can only get so efficient converting sunlight to energy and wind to energy, and we're getting very close to those physical limits. So we don't expect to see great improvements in these technologies. Plus, you have to store the energy in batteries then to use it later. Well, Tesla has built the world's largest battery factory. It would take Tesla 500 years to make enough batteries to power the U.S. for one day. It's just not feasible right now, so to mandate and to force us to quickly switch over is not a wise decision. And you have to do a lot of mining to make the windmills and solar panels and the batteries. And these are non-renewable resources. So when you're done with them, they get thrown on the, the trash piles. <laughs> and all these things, because they're non-renewable, which they're pushing the renewable resources, but when these things are done, they're just gonna be sitting in landfills like that. And you have to use a lot of fossil fuels to run the factories to make the solar panels and those wind machines there. So should we get rid of solar and wind? No, we don't have to get rid of them. We can still kind of experiment with them and see if there's any other options, but you don't switch over to them until you're ready for many, many reasons. We also are told about the world being overpopulated. Too many people on this planet, we have to do something serious. It is a serious, serious issue. The current population is like 7.8 billion people. This is a very, very powerful visual here. You could take every single person on the face of this planet and they would all fit in the state of Texas, but they wouldn't fill the state. They would only take up 0.1% of the state. The rest of the planet would be empty. Are there too many people on the planet? No. Are there too many people in certain areas? Yeah, you might have too many people, China, India, or whatever, but there's plenty of space on this earth. It's not like God is saying, oh my word, I had no idea what these people were going to do. I should have made it bigger. God knew what he was doing. He knew how many people would be here at every point in time in history. So can we get this many people, the 7.8 billion that we have today, can we get those, that many people in 6,000 years? Why would I 6,000 6, years? Most of you know, when you look at a biblical chronology thing, from us back to Christ, no question, about 2,000 years. Atheists know there was a guy named Jesus about 2,000 years ago. From Jesus back to Abraham, atheists know there was a guy named Abraham. He lived about 4,000 years ago. 
from Abraham back to Adam and Eve. You look at the biblical genealogies and chronologies, you get about another 2,000 years. It's a whole other talk, but I think it's very powerfully defensible through Scripture. Biblical history goes back roughly 6,000 years. I know a lot of Christians will argue with that. That's a whole other talk. But we're talking about a 6,000-year time span. Can we actually get 7.8 billion people in that short period of time? Well, let's start out with a single couple. Maybe not this couple. They're probably not going to have any kids. Uh, how about this couple here? <laughs> so we start out with two people here. It only takes 32 doublings to give you 8.5 billion people. That's more than we have today. You just have to double 32 times. 2, 4, 8, 16, just 32 times. To double 32 times in 6,000 years, you only have to double it once every 187 years. Is that possible? Well, our current doubling rate is 40 to 50 years. It only takes 40 to 50 years today to double the population. So we only need 187. We, we could do it even slower and still come up with more people than we have today. It's no problem whatsoever getting the people we have today. It makes a lot of sense with the time frame we're given. More interesting question. How many people should be on the planet if we've been evolving for six million years from an ape-like creature? Because that's what we're taught. That's a fact. Science has proven that. Six million year history from an ape-like creature to a modern human. Let's be conservative. Let's not talk about all of human evolution. Let's just talk about modern man. How long has modern man been around? They say maybe 200,000 years from when we were in our modern form to today. Let's be even more conservative. Let's just say we've only been around 50,000 years in our modern form to today. How many people should be on the planet if we've been reproducing even at slow conservative growth rates? How many people should be here today in that period of time? It would be this many people. A one with a hundred zeros after it. Just this portion up here is more than we have today. That's 10 billion. We only have 7.8 billion. So just that portion is more than we actually have today. But we got to come up with this entire number. Now, atoms are very small. In fact, you could have 20 million trillion atoms in a single grain of sand. That's a big number. But guess what? That number is much smaller than the people that should be on this planet today. <laughs> that's a huge number, but that's tiny compared to the people that should be on the planet today if we've been around 50,000 years. You would need 100 million trillion universes and count all the atoms in all those universes to come up with that number. It just, it doesn't line up whatsoever. Oh, they say, yeah, but we've grown so slowly over six million years that we just now have reached 7.8 billion people. Well, it's not really feasible at all, but even if that happened, where are the artifacts and bones and skeletons from the trillions and trillions of people that would have lived and died during that time? We should be drowning in all those things. And yet it's really rare that we run into a pot or a leg bone or something like that. We find them once in a while, but we should be drowning in them. But they don't exist. Jacques Cousteau, many of you are old enough to remember Jacques Cousteau. I grew up watching him, fascinating guy, uh, certainly not a creationist. But this is what he said a few years ago. In order to stabilize world population, we, must, we need to eliminate 350,000 people a day, a day. What does he mean by eliminate? I think you know what he means by eliminate. And there are many people in high levels of government who are very serious about getting the population down, and they have very scary ideas of how to do it. You know, first someone's on life support, just pull the plug. I mean, their life is pretty much over. They're not contributing. They're just taking up valuable resources. Then maybe you just get to a certain age, you should be done. Do, do the world a favor, just end your life. Maybe people who have other you know, physical ailments. We certainly are doing that on the front end with abortion, you know, millions and millions of babies, and then just on and on and on. At some point, you might want to get rid of all the people on the planet that are causing all the problems, the Christians. You know, and we've seen throughout history trying to eliminate groups of people. And it's happened. This is not just some dream thing or conspiracy theory. No, it's happened throughout history, and we're all very well aware of that. So there are many people who are serious about we have to get the population down. So world population is not an issue, but they will use it for alarmism to get you to do what they want you to do because you're worried we're going to eat up all of our resources here. 
So back more specifically to climate change. As I mentioned before, climate change is climate change. The climate has always been changing and it always will. I guarantee you if the climate ever stopped changing, alarms would be going off and they'd say, the climate has always changed and now it's not and we're causing it to not change and that's bad and we gotta do something. So give us all your tax dollars and don't drive cars anymore and just, they're, they're gonna be upset one way or the other because they don't really care about the issue so much. They want to accomplish something else and they'll use whatever the issue of the day is to accomplish it. <laughs> so uh, last summer I was asked to go out to Glacier National Park and do some lecturing and then do some hiking. And there's a sign out there that said this, the glaciers will be all gone you know, by the year 2020. Further, I want to say this, they are rapidly shrinking due to human-caused climate change. So not only are they shrinking, they know why they're shrinking. It's human-caused climate change. So not even just climate change, but human-caused climate change. Computer models indicate the glaciers all will be gone by the year 2020. Well, I was out there in 2020, and guess what? The glaciers are still there. Guess what's gone? The sign. <laughs> They had to take the sign down because they were terribly wrong about their prediction and, and the computer models. I, I had a longer version of this talk and I had to take it out, but models are only good garbage in, garbage out. I did computer programming for 12 years and I know how you can program things to get the output that you want. And so a lot of these models are set up to get the output that they want and you only see those outputs. You don't know what they're putting in and you don't know what's going on internally to get the outputs that they want. Now 2020 also was the 50th anniversary of the first Earth Day and a lot of predictions were made 50 years ago and I'm going to highlight just I think about eight of the 13 failed predictions because what happens is people make predictions and they alarm everyone and then they fail but people forget like oh yeah I forgot they made that prediction they were wrong they were wrong they were wrong all we know is today now they really know because the computer models have been refined and boy do we know for sure that in three years California is going to be underwater which maybe isn't a bad thing but um, <laughs> but they know and so they get you kind of panicking about things well let's just take a look at some of these here their first one was this civilization will end within 15 or 30 years unless immediate action is taken against the problem facing mankind 15 to 30 years from 1970 would be 1985 to the year 2000. I, I don't remember the world ending, and I think they were actually wrong about that. Their fourth one, population will inevitably and completely outstrip whatever small increases in food supplies we make. The death rate will increase until at least 100 to 200 million people per year will be starving to death during the next 10 years. All that never happened. Um, in a decade, urban dwellers will have to wear uh, gas mass to survive air population. By 1985, air pollution will have reduced the amount of sunlight reaching the earth by one half. That never happened. And can you even imagine having to wear a mask? Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> we've, we've gone through that. <laughs> How soon we forget. Um, but, you know, and they, they mandated those things. Number nine, at the present rate of nitrogen buildup, it's only a matter of time before light will be filtered out of the atmosphere and none of our land will be usable. <laughs> uh, that was wrong. Number 13, the last one. The world has been chilling sharply for about 20 years. If present trends continue, the world will be about four degrees colder for the global mean temperature in 1990, but 11 degrees colder in the year 2000. This is about twice what it would take to put us into an ice age. Did we have an ice age in 2000? I might have blinked and missed that one. <laughs> totally wrong. At that point, they were talking about getting colder. Now we're talking about getting warmer. So I would give Earth Day an F minus for their predictions. But do they broadcast that on all the news media outlets saying, hey, remember these 13? Yeah, they were. No. They forget about it because they got new predictions. So forget about that. Yeah, they might have been wrong before, but now they really know. Quick climate overview, I've taken some slides out here. I'm not gonna go through all the different layers in our atmosphere, but I do wanna answer one question that everyone asks, especially children. All children ask this question, why is the sky blue? <laughs> okay, no, they ask, why is the sky blue? So, 
I think that's funny. <laughs> so that's just my bad sense of humor. Some of you were smiling. Thank you for that. Um, I'm not going to go into the details. It, it has to do with certain wavelengths of light that are shorter, that are, are the blue spectrum. They get reflected more to your eye, so the sky looks blue because you're seeing more of those wavelengths than the, the longer wavelengths in the red on the other end spectrum, but it's not that important. Uh, I'm going to skip some of this. How light comes in and gets reflected from the Earth, and some of it gets trapped in our atmosphere, and it's a good thing. If we didn't have that, it would be way too cold, and we might, light might not even be possible. So the greenhouse effect is a good thing. Um, could it, you get out of control and get too warm for some reason? Yeah, possible. I don't think that's happening, but that's the greenhouse effect. We need to answer three huge questions. And these questions are so huge, they don't even fit on the screen. <laughs> but if we don't answer these three questions, you can't really have a sensible conversation about climate change. Number one, is the climate changing? Number two, if the climate is changing, is the change bad? And number three, how much of the change of any is caused by human activity? Those are very, very important questions. So very, very quickly go back to number one. Is the climate changing? Yes, it's changing. It's always changed. We have a pretty good history of it. Um, again, my animations aren't working quite right, so there's multiple texts up here. But 950 to 1200 AD, there was slightly warmer than today, about one degree Celsius. Then it dropped about two degrees. And then it started warming again in medieval warm period. They had a little ice age, a little bit medieval warm period. And then it's had some slightly slight warming and a slight decline more recently. So anyway, it's, it's just changed a little bit, fluctuated throughout history. We've measured that. It's not been extreme in any one direction or the other. Second question, if, if the climate is changing, is the change bad? Now, that's really interesting. How are we going to determine that? I came up with just a simple short analogy. Um, Let's, oh uh, yeah, this isn't going to work. I'll tell you what should have been there. There was a, a yellow figure guy there, and he's going to go outside, and then the snow comes up on the screen. So he's going to go outside, and you find out it's snowing out. It's cold out, so he's going to change. So I click, and then he puts on an undershirt. And I go, that's a change. And that's a good change, because he's going to go outside. It's cold out. So and then he puts a t-shirt on. Well, that's further change, and that would be good, too. It's, I mean, it's snowing out. And then he puts on a sweater on top of the whole thing there. It continues to change. Well, again, that, that's good. It, it's cold out. That's going to be really good. But then you find out he's not going outside for another 20 minutes. Well, at that rate, he's going to be the Michelin Tire Man. He's going to be so huge, he'll fall down out there. He won't be able to get up, and he'll freeze to death overnight. You took some existing change in a short period of time, and then you extrapolate it. He's just going to keep changing like that forever, and that would be bad. So we see slight changes today. It's a little bit warmer. It's a little bit colder. Well, that continues. We're going to freeze to death. That continues. We're going to burn up. You know. So they take these things, put them in their model, crank it out like, oh, yep, we got to get rid of fossil fuels today. We got to stop doing this. We got to get rid of cows. You know, no more farming. No more milk from them. And just drink almond milk, whatever that is. Um, it's all these things because of what they're telling us happens. So they see a little bit of real change and extrapolate those things. It's something similar to what they do with when they dig ice cores. They will drill into the ice, and they will see all these layers in the ice, and they will assume that one layer formed per year. So they will count down. They'll see, oh, we think we see 10,000 layers here. So down here, that was, oops, let me back up and forward. Right here, let's say that's 10,000 layers down. So they'll measure the amount of carbon dioxide in that layer, or oxygen or whatever, and they'll, they'll tell us what the Earth's atmosphere was like 10,000 years ago, what the climate was like. And then they'll say 30,000 layers down here 30,000 years ago, that this is what the climate was like. Well, they're assuming one layer forms per year. Well, guess what? That's a bad assumption. We've seen multiple layers form in a single year because within a winter, you have slightly warmer periods where it'll melt and form another layer, melt and form another layer. We know that you can't say one layer per year but they'll make that assumption to get the results they want. Very, very similar with radiometric dating. When they're dating the layers in the Earth there, there are a lot of assumptions behind radiometric dating. I'm sure you've had speakers come in here and give lectures on that. I give a series of lectures on those things. You make bad assumptions, you're going to come out with bad results. And so these 100 million years, 1 billion years that they come out with a lot of these methods are based on the assumptions they make up front, which are really bad assumptions. They're not scientific, and we have great reasons to know why 
why they're false assumptions. So radiometric dating is gonna come up with false ages, but it helps back up their narrative, and we see something similar going on with climate change. The third question is how much of the change, if any, is caused by human activity? I don't have time to do this justice. We could have some really good debates. Does our day-to-day -day activity really significantly affect the amount of you know, carbon, uh, and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and all that? I have opinions on that. You can talk to me later. Uh, this one it gets a little too involved for me to do it justice. I don't think that we are really a significant factor. Does that mean we shouldn't care? No, I think we should be wise stewards, good stewards of the earth that God gave us. But we shouldn't go overboard. We're more concerned about those things than we are about babies. Go ahead and kill the babies, but make sure that you don't you know, drive your car around too much or whatever, because that would be bad, because people in the future might get sick and they might die, but, but kill the babies. You know, it just, again, makes no sense. That's part of my heart is uh, pro-life movement. I keynote, uh, was a keynote speaker for two pro-life banquets in Washington State the first time a few months ago, and it, I got so worked up about that and so passionate about supporting that movement, um, so it's on my heart. 1975, some of you were alive uh, during that year. Science News had a cover saying, the ice age cometh. You probably remember, we were worried about going into an ice age. Well, that didn't work well for them. So they moved from global cooling to global warming. Well, that didn't line up very well for them, so then they just went to climate change. Now, any change at all, it's bad, and you're the reason it's happening. <laughs> so it's, that's clever. I mean, this, this is brilliant to, to just say climate change. So no matter what happens, it's bad, and you're causing it. And they got themselves covered because all the news medias are all on the same page, same narrative. Uh, back to PragerU, I, I just think they produce some really good information, a lot of good videos. I haven't seen all their videos. I don't know if I agree with everything they've ever said. Probably not. They probably wouldn't agree with me. But the few things I have seen, I thought, wow, very well done. So I want to end with this. They did a great summary about climate change that I thought is so good. I want to reproduce some of it here, give them credit for it. This is Richard Linsden. MIT atmospheric physicist, he's one of the world's leading climatologists. So that means he's right about everything, right? Because he's a leading expert. No, but he's very impressive, so I think he deserves to be heard. So you're gonna hear his summary uh, about climate change, which I think he just did a great job. It says, when you're talking or thinking about climate change, we're dealing with three groups of people. The first two groups, they're scientists. The third group, is made up of politicians, environmentalists, and media. The first group of scientists consists of the International Panel on Climate Change. This is a small group of scientists who are really concerned about climate change, and they mostly believe that recent warming is due to man's burning of fossil fuels, which is oil, coal, and natural gas. So it's a relatively small group, and, but they think there's, there's a concern here, so they got together and they're on this panel. The other scientists, much, much larger group, they're skeptics, they're called climate deniers. They don't deny climate, they just don't think the extreme conclusions that others have come up with are valid. But this other group of scientists, huge group, they believe that there are many reasons why the climate changes. The sun with solar flares and things like that, clouds, ocean, uh, orbital variations, etc. And none of these factors are truly understood and there's no evidence that CO2 emissions are the dominant factor. That's what they believe as scientists. Here are five points of agreement between these two groups, the smaller, more extreme group and all the other scientists. This is what they agree on. Number one, they all agree that the climate is always changing. Number two, CO2 is a greenhouse gas that's necessary for life and adding more would, would lead to some warming. Yeah, we can do the physics on that. <laughs> Atmospheric CO2 has been increasing since the end of the Little Ice Age, since the mid 1800s. That's obvious, there was a Little Ice Age, it was a little bit cooler, and it was a good thing no one wants to live in an ice age. We were glad that it warmed up and we don't have to continue to live through that. Number four, over the past 200 years, Earth's temperature has increased slightly and erratically, about one degree Celsius total. It's only since the 1960s that man's activities have been sufficient enough to play a role. Number five, no confident prediction of future global average temperatures or its impact can be made even according to this International Panel on Climate Change. The, the more extremists who are concerned, they admit we, these factors are unknown, there's no way you can make a confident prediction. 
So why are we hearing all these confident predictions of exactly what's going to happen if we don't change everything right now? And here's the shocker. Well, you're not going to see that because it's covered up. Let me see if I can remember what this is. None, no one of these groups believes that burning fossil fuels leads to catastrophe. None of them, even the extremists, don't think that if we continue to burn fossil fuels, it's going to be catastrophic. Might it have an effect? The extreme group says, yeah, we think there's going to be an effect, but they don't think it's going to be catastrophic. So where does the alarmism come from? It comes from group number three, the politicians, environmentalists, and the media. The politicians are driven by money and power. The environmentalists are driven by money for their organizations and their confirmation of their religious-like beliefs that man is an evil disease, disease destroying nature. In the media, they are driven by ideology, money, and headlines. So climate change is climate change. I personally don't buy into all the extreme things that they tell us and how radical we have to change our lives in this world or otherwise we're just all doomed within a few years. But wrapping the whole thing up, summarizing everything, scientifically, you will never know. I will never know. Because we don't know everything. We don't even have access to all the data that they're supposedly looking at. We don't see what tests they're doing. We don't see their models that they're using. And uh, there's just so many details we'll never know. And even if you were exposed to all the raw data, you might not be in a position to interpret it. And even if you could interpret it, we might discover some new data that changes our own minds on what we think. You'll just never really fully know scientifically. And it's not really so much settled science, it's settled narrative. This is what's true, you must trust it, don't question it. And the issue is never really the issue. And this is my strong opinion. I think many people involved in different areas, whether it's COVID, climate change, or whatever, many of them, in my opinion, aren't really that concerned about that issue. It's just a very convenient issue to get people to do something else. They can frighten you with climate change, with COVID or with whatever else is, is going on. Something new could come up and they jump on it like, well, we could use this. And there are people who have admitted that. They don't really care about that. They're just using it as a tool to accomplish something else. Uh, keep balance. Don't go overboard regarding any particular issue. If you feel God leading you to research more on COVID or climate change or whatever is going on, then I guess you need to do that. But keep a balance. Don't make that your only thing. That's the only thing you talk about and beat people with it and make them shame them if they don't believe what your conclusions might be. And scripture is our ultimate authority. Because we're not going to know, we can say to God, I am so confused because I am watching all these videos and I watched these two completely opposing videos and they both sound awesome. They both made sense to me, but they're contradicting each other. I, I don't know what to think. So in light of that, God, what do you want me to do? And as you read God's word, God can guide you into whatever action he wants you to take. It doesn't have to be based on the fact that you know the settled science and you know all the details better than anyone else. You've looked into it, but now you say, okay, God, what, what do you want me to do? And allow the Holy Spirit to guide you don't let the other scientists guide you. Don't let me guide you. You don't need to listen to me and obey anything I'm saying. You know, think through what I'm presenting, but ultimately take it back to Scripture, pray and say, God, what do you want me to do? And bring the focus back to Scripture and the gospel message. Don't get caught up in debating some of climate change when that's your only goal is to show them that they're wrong about whatever they think and you're right about whatever you think. Get into the conversation, but then ask them, Let's say climate change got so bad, you ended up dying. Or COVID got so bad, you ended up dying. What do you think would happen to you when, after you die? And listen to them. Hear what they say. Hear what their concerns are. And after they share that, you can ask them questions like, oh, what led you to that conclusion? How confident are you that that's actually true versus like, I don't know, I'm just guessing. After they share all that, it's very natural for you then to step in and say, hey, let me tell you kind of where I am. And then you could tell them about your belief in Scripture and that God is the Creator. And yeah, things are going downhill, but you can say, I'm not surprised because the Bible actually predicted a lot of this. So what are, you, what are you talking about? Well, the Bible says this and that, and this is going to happen, and all the things that are going to happen during the end times and all that. And they'll probably be very intrigued. Like, really? It says it in there? So yeah, what else does it say? Well, it says this is what happens to people when they die. And you talk, 
Share the gospel message with them. Use this upside down world to your advantage. The worse things get, the more people are willing to hear hope. And we as Christians are the only ones who have the true hope of Jesus Christ. So don't get overwhelmed with how bad things are. It's probably not going to get any better. Just say, okay, God, help me get to work. And God will bring people in your path, people I will never meet. It's not about me getting around talking to everyone. It's about you sharing what you do know that God has shared with you. God opened your eyes spiritually. Help other people to have their eyes open spiritually when you share God's word with them and the Holy Spirit does all the heavy lifting. Uh, so that's what we want to do with this whole uh, settled science thing. It's, it's not about getting an attitude or being angry. I hope I don't come across anger. I'm just very passionate about God's Word and getting Christians to focus more on that than going down rabbit trails about any particular issue. Because even if we settled climate change and COVID, something else is going to come up to replace it in a heartbeat. So we need to be consistently relying on God's Word for our direction and to be a light in, in a dark world. Sure, good question about, you know, the new telescopes are fascinating and sending just beautiful pictures of God's universe. And, you know, they're telling us how many millions or billions of light years away these objects are. So the question comes up, okay, if they're showing us these beautiful stars that are 200 million light years away or a billion light years away or 13.8 billion, which they say is the beginning of the universe, how does that jive with the Bible when the Bible gives us a 6,000 year history? It's a great, great question. I answered it a couple nights ago at the church, so I'll give you the same answer. Um, and there's just a tiny bit of background, and then I'll answer it directly, and I won't get technical. Um, I've heard answers on this from many other friends of mine who are creationists, and they give cool answers, but they're so technical, it's hard to grasp, and it's not useful because you're not going to be able to remember to repeat it to anyone, so it doesn't help as much. So. The most important thing I can share right up front is, um, number one, that's a challenge, it's a question, it's a legitimate question a creationist who believes in a young universe has to answer. What most people don't know is the people who buy into the billions of years, Big Bang, 13.8 billion years, whether they're atheists or Christians or just religious people or whatever, they have the same problem to address. The problem of how you get light to travel a certain distance in a certain period of time. We're talking about how do you get light from the whole universe in 6,000 years. They're talking about how do you get light to travel all the way across the universe in 13.8 billion years. In their model, they don't have enough time. In 13.8 billion years, there's not enough time for light to have reached from one side all the way to the other side of the universe. But they believe it must have traveled that distance because when they check the temperature of the universe, all over. It's the same temperature. But they know the only way the universe could be the same temperature all over is if light could travel from one side to the other side to smooth the temperature out. Quick analogy. Hot cup of coffee in your kitchen. Say it's 120 degrees or whatever. If it sits there long enough, it cools down and the room warms up a tiny bit. And pretty soon everything's room temperature, right? If it sits there long enough. If you walk in the kitchen, you pick it up, it's still hot. You know it hasn't been sitting there very long, right? If it's cooled down all the way, you know it's, it's probably been there long enough. So the side that believes in 13.8 billion years they have an issue, there's not enough time for the coffee cup to have spread its heat out to the universe, the light to travel. So from the get-go, we have the same problem. So it's not something like, oh, we better answer, otherwise they win. It's like, no, we, we both need to address this issue. <laughs> it's called the light travel problem. So very quickly now, how does each side answer the question? Well, since it's an event that happened a long time ago that we weren't around to see, we can't prove it. Neither side could prove anything. All we can do is come up with models that help us understand what might have occurred to answer it. What does the side do who buys into the Big Bang in billions of years? They literally make things up. I'm not saying they're lying. I'm saying they make up science that goes against the science we know today. They say, maybe the laws of physics were different back then. Maybe they were, but you just stepped outside of science when you're 
postulating that the science and the values and factors were different back then. That's not a scientific answer, that's a philosophical answer. So they say maybe the laws were different and they envisioned that when the Big Bang occurred, not only did it expand, but early on it expanded super fast in a point of time they call inflation. It expanded faster than the speed of light. So while the universe is still really small, it expands so fast it spread the light out all over, same temperature, and now that it's the same temperature, it expands from there smoothly. <laughs> and you know what? That could explain that. If the universe truly did expand faster than the speed of light, that would spread out the temperature. The problem is there's nothing in physics that could do that. There's no evidence that that happened. They just need it to happen. So they kind of make that up to get around it. Now they got a problem. They spread it out you know, evenly, but now the universe is expanding too fast. You can't get stars, galaxies, and planets. So they had to slow it down. What's going to slow it down? It's not expanding into anything. <laughs> They just need it to slow down. And not only do they need it to slow down, it has to slow down to the perfect, 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 perfect razor edge speed, because if they slow it down a little too much, it collapses in on itself, you don't have a universe. They don't slow it down enough, or it expands too fast, and you don't get stars, galaxies, and planets. So it has to be this unbelievably coincidental, perfect, perfect, perfect speed. Um, they have other problems too, but so that's that side. And inflation's not testable. If you can't test it, it doesn't qualify as a model. So that's what they're doing. They're desperate to just put band-aids on this to make it work. What does the other side do that has you know, a belief in a younger universe? We start with the known laws of physics, like general relativity from Einstein. Gravity affects time. I won't go into the technical details. We have tested this in the laboratory over and over and over. We know that gravity actually affects time. Seems bizarre, but it's true. In fact, if we didn't take that into account and know about it, your phones wouldn't work. GPS wouldn't work because it bounces off satellites. The satellites are up in space and time is ticking at a different speed. It's slightly faster out there because it's further away from the center of gravity on the Earth. It's a slight amount, but we have to take that difference into account when we use our phones and our GPSs because gravity affects time. So we use known laws of physics to come up with models that could potentially explain how could light travel so far in a short period of time. And there are a number of models that they'll talk about, and some of them get pretty technical, but we're using known laws of physics versus making up stuff that goes against the laws of science that we actually know. So both sides have an issue, we both come up with an answer, and none of us will ever know for sure, but at least we're using known laws of science to do it. And that's how, when they're showing us these pictures, they can say it's 13.8 billion years away, but they don't know that they're making assumptions of how light travels in space and in the past and all that. So great question, and that was a longer answer than normal. <laughs> so they, we probably have time for one more question, just because that, that was an important question because a lot of people wonder about that. If not, I will be out in the lobby briefly afterwards if you want to you know, talk to me individually with some questions, or you can also contact us at our website anytime too at thestartingpointproject.com. <laughs>